Yeah, the end of our song, our second song today said, let that peace begin with me. And in our reading, we hear Christ telling us to start with ourselves, to look at ourselves and release the plank from our own eye first before we judge others. Interesting message. I think it's quite apt for most of us to be told not to judge. Not even not to judge so much, he says. He starts by saying, do not judge. How, how do you not judge? How do you not judge? I feel like most of our waking life is filled with judgment. Filled with judgment. And I can't help when I hear those words from Christ connected back to our other reading today from Genesis. This idea that humanity represented by Adam and Eve in that story lived in a garden of Eden. Humanity was close to our roots and lived in paradise. But when we imbibed in the one tree that was poisonous in the garden, the one tree that God said was not good for food, we fell out of our beatific state. We fell into anxiety, suffering, despair. What could that mean? Well, a big hint, I think, is the fact that this tree is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. Sounds like the tree of judgment to me. But don't we need some knowledge of good and evil? Isn't that kind of the point of the Bible or religion? Strange. A lot to chew on. Of course, we all have to answer this for ourselves. But when I think about judgment, an over-judgment, if you want to call it that, I think about our tendency to be too into our knowledge, all knowledge, all knowledge, all thinking, the knowledge tree. Too invested in this small layer of life, of an analysis. And maybe that's the human condition today. Maybe that's what it means by the story of the Garden of Eden. We consume too much from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We lean too much to judgment. I do it. Even if I'm thinking maybe someone shouldn't judge as much, I'm probably doing it. So... And in reality, it's an invitation to just find some freedom in life out of our overthinking. It's not something you hear very often from people. Every once in a while, calm down or something like that. Maybe a, a rare friend says, get out of your head, you're in your head too much. But what does that even mean? It seems like everything is in our head. All experience, in fact, seems to be in our head. But I think it ties back to these ancient lessons, this ancient tale from Genesis, told orally by the indigenous Jewish people for many generations before written on scrolls. And like many indigenous tales, uses story, it uses parable to speak to greater truths about life, truths about spirit, about each of us right now. Not as much about facts as we think of them. Not as much about facts. I don't know if you've heard, but recently in the world of science, the James Webb Space Telescope has gone online. And it's provided some amazing pictures of resolution beyond m most of our dreams. <laughs> amazing things. But what they've discovered pretty much immediately once this came online a month or two ago, is that what we thought the universe looked like in the past, because when the further out we look, the further back in the past we look, as you all know, isn't quite a, what we've seen. We thought we'd see evidence for an early universe in various ways, according to our physics models, 
early galaxies are certain size, certain shapes. They're a little bit more unstructured, a little bit younger, let's say. <laughs> but what they've seen as they look back in the past are still very old galaxies, very old galaxies that would take billions of years to form. Not the huge monstrosities, but something surprising. And strangely enough, this has upended how we, or them, in the scientific world, think about the beginning of the universe. It's almost definitely much older than 14 billion years old. And also, this idea, this very popular idea, something I prescribe to, the Big Bang, is perhaps not the start of the universe. The evidence for the Big Bang was this expansionary tale, this history of galaxies, space, that we thought we'd see evidence for, but instead, quite the opposite. And so all of a sudden, something that many people have taken to be so true, so close to heart, not supported anymore. And many of us who haven't heard the news, we don't know that yet. We're so caught up in that idea, if we think about that at all. And I thought it was just funny how something so clear, so obvious to most of us, suddenly is, oh, it was never true. Never. Never true. It's kind of beautiful in a way. But it does feel like a rug's been pulled out from under us sometimes. When we think about how many things we thought would be a certain way, and they end up another way. And funny enough, I think of Genesis as almost the exact opposite of the Big Bang story. The history of the Big Bang is quite a lot of support, growing support, even among the religious. We're not creationists here for the most part, as far as I know, but... And then all of a sudden falls through. Genesis, on the other hand, a lot of dismissive attitudes, I think. A lot of creationists use Genesis to support a very kind of shallow idea of the earth that doesn't fit any of the evidence. And then they say, well, the evidence is wrong for all these reasons that they make up or they've been told. It doesn't matter how much evidence... Because Genesis said it, right? Genesis said it. But like all good indigenous tales, like all of our greatest stories, like the story of Queen Elizabeth, for that matter, what we learn from these stories are deeper lessons, not just facts. We may not even have the facts exactly right, but deeper lessons that speak to each of us in different ways. Queen Elizabeth's life speaks to each of us in different ways. Some of us may even have quite an issue with her legacy. Who knows? And Genesis is a story like that, told over the campfire, told next to food, that shared deeper wisdom, a return to the garden. In fact, yes, it does tell a story of leaving the garden, but why else tell a story like that than to invite us back? I said in our written message, um, it's kind of like a bad country song in reverse, you know? You get your lady back, you get your truck back, you get your dog back. <laughs> get your sobriety back if you play it in reverse. That's Genesis, getting everything back. And what's interesting is that a story like this points us to something we already actually still have. We have the Garden of Eden at our core. That's what our sages tell us. That's what Christ told us. Often we're too in our judgment, though, to notice. We identify too much with our thinking. When we're bored, we're too bored. When we're upset, definitely too upset. Fearful, takes the cake. Annoyed, 
instead of just noticing that this tree of knowledge is in a garden, there's a spaciousness around it. We don't have to imbibe in this poisonous fruit so much. It's still there. Tree of knowledge is listed at the beginning of this description of the Garden of Eden as being in the middle of the garden, just the one tree we're not supposed to eat from. Doesn't mean shutting off our thinking, shutting down our knowledge, but it is an invitation to not invest so much, not pluck each fruit as it comes, to maybe notice that we're always aware of our changeful attitudes, we're always aware of our thoughts, our minds. If I ask you if you're aware right now, something sages are like to do nowadays anyway, you can say, yes, oh, I'm, I am aware right now. And that just that quick reflection takes us out of whatever we're thinking for a moment to notice, yeah, that's, I'm always aware for the most part. In my dreams, I'm aware. I may forget what they are. I'm always aware. There's a spaciousness to awareness because I think it's more us than how we often define ourselves. We're so caught up in this tree of history. Someone let us down. It bugs us. We add insult to injury for ourselves. They can never be right again, right? Sometimes it's the future. We feel we need to be successful in some way. We feel this pressure to live up to our own expectations, what we think other people may want, what we think may be good. It's hard to know what's good. And that's the truth of judgment in general. We're not good assessors of our own judgment. We're just not. No matter how wise or humble or caring you are, you're quite biased about it. And here's Christ telling us not to judge, lest we be judged. Do not judge. He says, because you will be judged the way you judge. You know, I've heard sermons in the past that say, well, that doesn't mean don't judge, despite the statement. It means just be good at judgment. <laughs> be better. I think that's, I mean, it sounds reasonable. But again, we're terrible assessors. Terrible assessors. But when I think about not judging, I think because I relate so much to judgment, I think, how do I live? How do I live? Well, the tree of knowledge is still there. And perhaps there's a wisdom that I don't know too much about. Perhaps there's a love, a compassion in life that's here with me because maybe it is life. But I don't let myself live in it, to be in it as often as I should. Maybe if I divest a little bit from that next thought, knowing that I'll change my mind later, knowing that I'll think of how I'm wrong, or it'll just move on by. I'll find a more stable way of living, a more grounded way of living, noticing what's always there, that spaciousness of the garden, the light of God. There's a reason Christ tells us we're the light of the world. It says he's the light of the world, and he tells us you're the light of the world. Something I think we can miss. We are the light of the world. The light of consciousness, of love. Of nature, of being. Maybe we're not so small as we think. Maybe we're not so isolated. We've learned to identify ourselves as body, mind. Maybe we're one in the garden. One with God and with the light of love. Now let's take a moment to enjoy the spaciousness around us. To enjoy the tree of life at our core with the tree of knowledge. and everything else that the garden has for us.
not being too judgmental about ourselves either. It's easy to be judgmental about ourselves. We start to internalize the voices of our youth, maybe even ones we've forgotten. The mode of society is often a mode of judgment, of boxing in. And just noticing that judgment. But above all, noticing that we always notice. Our experience is never ending, always changing. We don't have to invest so much in one treat. <laughs> we can help this earth return to the garden together with our friends, our neighbors, across party lines, across religious differences, through reconciliation. But it begins with us ourselves. Thank you.